All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode one of Enlightened Neanderthals brought to you by Training Northwest. This is our inaugural podcast episode, and we screwed up right off the bat, and we had picked a different name um, around the fire, which was already taken. So we've changed the name. We like it better anyway. And uh, Jordan, you have anything to add to that? I hope you guys enjoy it. Yeah, no, it's uh, it, as we keep going, our podcasts are going to get better and better. Um, right now, we're just trying to get used to talking into a mic and everything else. So stick with us and it'll get better. All right. I hope you guys enjoy it and like, and subscribe, send it to your friends later. All right. We're recording. So here we are. I guess this is episode one. Um, what are we calling? We're calling this around the fire, around the fire podcast. Oh, yeah. If it's not taken. Fuck it. We'll, we'll, we'll make it ours if bad. it is taken. I like it. I doing, like it. Doing some Googling. Yeah. If so my, like, my thought was uh, for this first episode, like we'd go around, have you guys kind of introduce yourselves and talk about our motivations for why we want to do this. And just real quick, I'll say, so my name is Tobin Falk. Um, I own a, I don't even know what we want to call it. It's, I guess technically it's a firearms training company called Training Northwest, but I like to say that we're not teaching firearms. We're teaching like resilience and self-reliance and self-confidence and the reason I want to do this podcast is because I see us as already being involved in a cultural war right now. And I describe it as the Great Awakening versus the Great Reset. And the Great Reset is straight out of the, the, like the World Economic Forum literature, and it, it encompasses all this woke bullshit that's being pushed on society and, uh, you know, like um, control state and... Uh, God, just everything we've been going through since 2020, whereas the Great Awakening is people like me who, if you go back to 2019, and I was I was totally happy uh, just working construction, racing mountain bikes on the weekend, coaching my kids' little league team in the afternoons, and not paying much attention. And then the la- you know, events of 2020, 21, 22 have kind of caused me to awaken, I'm making air quotes, and start paying attention to all this shit because I think that if we don't start pushing back, then we will quickly find ourselves in a nation that's just run by, uh, you know, like a social credit system with, uh, uh, you know, the push for central banking, digital currency, CBDC, and uh, like a social credit style system where if you do something that the government doesn't approve of, like fact checkers have found that this is false, Mike. And so your, your bank account has been turned off for the next week just to make you hurt a little bit. Yeah. So that you know that next time don't, don't speak your mind because, uh, <laughs> cause we don't like it. And I think that it's coming, you know, toxic masculinity has been pushed. And part of the reason for pushing that narrative is to shut us up because we're the ones we're the, we're, we're the, we're the big speed bump in this uh, control state is, is men who aren't afraid to speak up, to stand up and if need be to fight. So part of, you know, we, the way we ended up sitting around this table right here, right now is at one point we were talking about the three of us doing a, just a hunting loadout video for, uh, for my training Northwest YouTube channel, just, just for fun. Cause it will be fun. And, uh, so we got together to have some beers and talk about uh, hunting loadout, and pretty quickly, I think Jordan, it took Jordan all of about two minutes to start spitting knowledge about backpack selection and whatnot, <laughs> and it was like, hang on, time out, time out, we just need to do a podcast, and we can talk about hunting, we can talk about whatever, like, my, my thing is, I think we should just talk about all things man, man, yeah. sh- man shit. Absolutely. Um, so anyway, let's, uh, let's go around the horn, I don't care who wants to go first, but introduce yourselves, tell us where you grew up, what you're about, and uh, then we'll get to... Uh, your motivations and why you guys are sitting here. Uh, my name's Mike Kozak. Uh, I'm a professional sticker installer, and I live <laughs> in the Snohomish Lake Stevens. Right, we're we're, we're going to have to cover that here. <laughs> Go ahead. Continue, Mike. Uh, yeah. Um, so that's who I am. Uh, you know, you guys through jujitsu and shooting and having good times. And yeah. Uh, I guess why I want to do this is I'm, I'm not, all right, here we go. You guys are more, um, not agenda driven, but 
you feel culture and society and the world kind of has a turning point or tipping point happening at the moment. And I think I read a book a long time called The Disaster Diaries by Sam Sheridan. And he went over a bunch of different scenarios for survival as to how you would live in an apocalypse situation. One was pandemic, one was alien invasion, one was everything. And the biggest thing I took away from that book is there's not one thing that helps you in life. When you're in bad situations, what helps you is everything you've done in that moment to get where you are there. He focused on strength. He focused on hunting. He focused on shooting. He focused on farming. He focused on all kinds of different things. And I just like being around people that are strong in their skills. You know, you're a former ranger. You have great skills for protection. You're a hunter. You've killed multiple animals, different types of genres from large to small game. Um, I mean, even our buddy Tyler, he's gotten obsessed with farming and trying to provide food, jujitsu, trying to hone in and have a particular set of skills that you're efficient with. And so for me, I don't know what's going to happen in these next coming years, but I just like being around people that really focus on being the best that they can be at particular skills, being a high efficiency operator, no matter what it is. Yeah, and that's awesome. Yeah. So uh, I'm just kind of here to share what I've learned over the years, the paths that I've taken to uh, develop some of these skills. I feel like Napoleon Dynamite when I say <laughs> skills, but um sweet ninja skills yeah yeah, yeah bow staff dude. skills um but that's kind of what i'm here and just you know talk about how, what we like to do how we do it and kind of the stuff going on right now and how we apply that to life i love hearing you say that because something i've been sort of reflecting on a lot recently is i started training at the gym which is how for you guys listening, the way the three of us know each other is through training at our friend Greg's gym at uh, Electric North in Lake Stevens, Washington. And what I've found over the last two years, like as all this shit is happening, as I'm starting to pay attention more, I've, I've sort of shifted my social circle. Like all my friends from before, those friendships are still valid. I still value those people. But over the last two years, as I've started training and as I've started kind of, I hate the word prepping because it makes it sound yeah. like you're some crazy negative. Yeah, yeah, negative connotations around it. But really like my wife's grandma cans her vegetables. In the, prepping. In, yeah. She's, is she, yeah. is she a crazy prepper or is she just <laughs> prepping for the season? She just to wants come, to eat yeah. vegetables in the winter. Yeah. That's yeah. a good point. Prepping for the season. I mean, that is life. I mean, yeah. I, yeah. I have a wood fireplace in my house. If I don't chop firewood in the summer, I'm not prepping for the next months. I'm not prepping for my energy bill, Yeah, you know? And so anyway, as I've started paying attention to more of this stuff, like my, the people I gravitate towards and the people that gravitate towards me has shifted to where my, my close circle is a bunch of like motherfuckers. Like, dude, if, if it really goes down, the people that are in my circle, I feel really good about how we would fare if regardless of whether it's, you know, government lockdowns or if we have the massive earthquake that we're supposed to have here in the Puget Sound or you know, whatever may come. I, I just like the fact that as I'm seeking to sort of make myself more bulletproof or more resilient, my my circle and my community is, is becoming more more bulletproof and more resilient. Yeah. But so like you, you kind of glossed over your your real quick uh, introduction. Like <laughs> let's let's go back, man, because Mike, you you've been you you've been fighting like you actually fought MMA in your younger yeah. years, correct? Uh, yes. Let's talk about how did how did you get your start in MMA? Uh, let's see. How did I really start? Uh, it started with f going to the bars with friends and watching UFC on, uh, fight nights. And I got so sick and tired of all of my drunk friends being like, I can do this. I I'm a badass. And none of them were badasses. They thought cause they did <laughs> bicep curls or bench press yeah. that that meant that they were a motherfucker. Yeah. And, just watching it and them saying they could do something and not doing it. I, in my head, I was just kind of like, 
I, I bet you if I really applied myself, I could do this. So I sought out uh, an MMA gym. Um, the one I ended up finally sticking with, my first MMA gym was Charlie's Combat in Everett. Did you tell him you were going to do it, or did you just, like, I quiet, just started quiet, quietly walk yeah, away? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The like, quiet right, motherfuckers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's go. Yeah, yeah, that was actually it. And it kind of drew me away from that group of people and that lifestyle of people that were just going out and having fun and talking about being a badass. I didn't want to be a badass. It was just, I just wanted to do something different or epic or try and challenge myself in a way that I felt other people in my circle weren't doing it. And day one, I was hooked. And I've never really stopped since. I changed gyms over the years and then got tired of getting punched and getting kicked. <laughs> so eventually I put a gi on and started really doing jujitsu. And then once I put that gi on, I was hooked, man. There's no way you could get it off. So right on. Yeah. And you you still teach kickboxing, right? On Sunday night? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that an official class or is that more like just the bros go in there? And- no, I mean, it's not technically, we don't have enough people. It started with my wife and I going and one of her friends uh, that just wanted to be active and you know you get together with your friends and it's kind of boring going for a run or doing I don't know a spin class or something (laughs) so I'm like hey I can show you guys how to you know and I I think it's important for women to learn a form of defense totally and so it started with let's get some exercise and also at the same time uh, let me show you some actual skills okay that'll help you because her friend was going to I don't know, it's like a oh, women's kickboxing class or, you know, that they have like in like a strip mall. And yeah, it's just, it's, it's more it's, exercise than yeah, actual combat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's someone that's never punched or fought or done anything before. And they're just reading off a sheet. And then you ask them for technique and they can't tell you shit. So I was like, let me show you guys how to properly do this and get exercise. And it's kind of just grown and now we do it every Sunday and we get a few guys from the gym that want to learn striking and it's usually the younger guys. Yeah. Um, seems like older people are set in their yeah, ways, we, but we don't young, like getting punched in the head. No, anymore. but younger guys <laughs> want to learn how to be more of a badass. It yeah. seems like, so yeah. yeah, it's kind of turned into that. All right. So Lake Stevens locals, what, what time on Sunday nights are you guys up there? Uh, 6 PM Sunday nights. Okay. Right on Jordan. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't have as deep of a bullshit a reason to do this. Oh, I, I thought just, you, you know, say as deep of a background <laughs> in martial arts. No, <laughs> no, just a, as, far, as far as like you know, getting into this and want to do a podcast. I just like you know, it's to what you said. I got a group of friends that I've had for a long time, and we haven't been um, kind of going in the same direction as far as what's been happening. And um, to what you said, Tobin, like you know, over the last two years being with you guys in the training and stuff, it's just kind of opened my eyes to possibilities and what we can do and how we can grow and the you know a rising tide rises all boats or lifts all all boats boats. yeah Yeah, right will that's your deal right there um so yeah that's that's been my my uh want for this and then also just kind of a self-serving want to hang out with you guys and fuck yeah uh, no have have a good time and have conversations that are meaningful or or you know yeah, the first time I I'm sat down with Greg on his podcast, I called him the next day. I was like, man, I don't care if our moms are the only people that listen to this. <laughs> it was so much fun to just sit down because normally it's like we're at the gym and a thousand people want to talk. You know, there's people kind of coming up and wanting to have like yeah. these little conversations and whatnot. But to actually sit down and have a focused conversation, and especially now that we're like middle aged and we're a little calmer and slower, like it's, it's really fun to just sit here at the table and talk to you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Jordan has, you've got an extensive uh, background in wrestling. Go ahead and let's hear yeah. about that. Well, I mean, I, I started wrestling when I was four um, and just kept it going from there. It was, I got lucky, you know, my parents kind of took me around. Uh, it was, it was in the age of karate being like, you know, the karate kid. Yeah. All the kids were doing it. Right. It was uh, the three ninjas or whatever that was hot at the time. The good movie, movie. You know, right. Yeah, that's a great. Movie. Um, so, I mean, a lot of, uh, a lot of that was happening and, we went to a uh, karate place before we went to wrestle. I was, you know, like I said, I was four. So, um, walked into this like dojo and 
we started talking and they lined us all up and it was nice and neat and everybody had to like, you know, bow and this whole kind of a weird process and I wasn't necessarily happy with it. And then I, uh, I had asked the, the teacher, you know, when do we start breaking wood and bricks and, <laughs> and ice? And he said, not for a long time. So, so we, wa- I walked this out. Is bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When, when I heard that, I was just like, all right, you know, that not feeling it. And then, um, you know, um, wrestling was the next weekend it kind of felt like it was just like we would, did that and it wasn't really working out and i think we were me and my brother were quite a handful for our parents like kind of just rough housing and stuff and we were we were kind of allowed to but i think it was getting to the point where i was like okay this we better find a mat to do this on Dude, I'm, I'm living that life right now with eight and 11 year old boys <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah so our parents were you know they took us to a wrestling room and i just remember walking in and everything was covered in mats and I was nice. just like the walls were and like I just running and bouncing off the wall and just, you know, and it's funny because we run a little kids program right now um, and they do the same thing. Yeah. They just see, oh, they yeah. see that wall and they just run straight for it. It's jump a padded up. room where you can see go who, as crazy yeah, as you want. Exactly. See who can jump the highest and hit the wall. And yeah, it's just a good time. So then uh, that happened and I just stuck with it and, um, you know, fell in love with it. So I, uh, I'm not necessarily a super athlete or anything like that, but I think starting at that age, you just kind of get better, <laughs> you know, just yeah, over, right. over the next 20 years of wrestling, I, I gained some skills. So then, and, so obviously high school. And then did you go, you wrestled at a college too, correct? I did. Yeah. Just a little JC. Um, I, uh, I got cancer my senior year of high school. I was Are getting ready. Serious? What? Yeah. I was getting ready. How to the go. fuck do we not know this? Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I got one, uh, Nut. One nut. What? Your, yeah, dude. Let's yeah, see. Uniball, and you want to <laughs> hold out your hand? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, in uh, in my senior year, um, I started getting really tired and like sluggish, and I had a health class, and the uh, the teacher they were going over like these major symptoms of different you know major cancers that affect the mass population, and um, they got to that unit, and uh, she was like, you know, there, if you have there's like seven major symptoms. If you have five or if you have one or two, that's, you know, that's kind of normal. Mm. So don't freak out. But if you have like four or five, six of them, like it's red flags and you need yeah. to go do something about it. So, yeah. um, and that was in the middle of the wrestling season. So I was like, well, shit, like it's my senior year. I'm not going to say anything. So I waited till the end of the season. And then I told my mom I had cancer and she goes, you know, don't say that. And then I was like, Oh, I'm just letting you know, you know, I got that going no on. So way. going God to damn. the doctors the next yeah. day and they're like, yeah, there's something going on here. So did you have to do chemo and stuff? No, I just did a little, like little bit of radiation. It wasn't anything about a half crazy. Cup? Yeah. About a half. About a cup. <laughs> yeah. And it, and it, yeah. And it was, it was just kind of, it was super like, it was like having a cold, you know, it was like, it was really? no big deal. Damn. Right. So like, I can say it and be like, yeah, I can answer, but like, I watched my cousin go through the same thing, but oh, shit. she really? went through like a hardcore bit of cancer. No shit. So for me, I was just like, eh, I can't really, you know, Dang. especially in the family, they're just like, you pussy. Like, <laughs> you <Yeah>. know? <laughs> wow. I, I woke up coming out of anesthesia and they started making fun of me instantly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, that's, that's the, that's the hardcore, right. you know? And I had my wrestling coach was in the room and like, yeah. so I, I kind of grew up in that wrestling room and, um, you know, had, had a tight knit, group of people and then uh i was gonna go to uh portland state had a a uh, wrestling program because all the wrestling's just been getting cut like crazy yeah. and i was gonna go there and then ended up going to a place called clackamas and glad i did you know it was a it was a savage room it yeah. felt like last chance you of wrestling you know Sorry. like we had <laughs> yeah. a bunch of d1 guys that were coming down and you know grades and this and that and guys are fighting in Bellator now and all this other kind of crazy shit from that team. And right on. Yeah. So it was, it was a, it was a gnarly room. Wrestling's Um, the best foundation, man. Yeah. It was, it was a blast. I did it middle school and high school. And uh, and to this day, um, so much of my game is based off of wrestling, just the fundamental movements. Yeah. And I mean, that's what got me. I mean, everything great in my life has come from that. Right. So like my job, my, I, and I, I got my job through a wrestling coach, like, you know, and like, or his wife, you know, and, uh, it just, everything, if I've, I've stuck with this sport so close and everything just seems to work out from it. Like even meeting you guys, if yeah. it wasn't for wrestling, I wouldn't have gone to the jujitsu gym, Yeah, you know, but I was like, I'm looking for a mat room and it was like, oh yeah, you know, cause I started going to Ivan's 
Ivan Salivary's down in, in Seattle, Seattle um, yeah. in 2011. And then, uh, oh, shit. yeah, yeah when long, I, long time ago. Yeah. And then when I moved up here, I, uh, you know, up in the Lake Stevens, I was looking around and, um, a couple guys at work actually were talking about it. So I was like, Oh, you know, I'll go check it out. And I thought it was uh, a different jujitsu gym in Lake Stevens. So, <laughs> yeah. so, but they were closed, you know? So I'm like driving around like, ah, eh, this doesn't seem like whatever, you know? Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, I ended up discovering it and actually going in and it was like, Oh, fucking sweet. You know, oh, this yes. is, this is my spot. And it was, it's just one of those, you know, electric North, you walk in and you just know, the, like the energy my, in my that room, the, the reason I keep going back, even when I'm injured and whatnot, is because you walk in and you can feel the energy in the room. And it's it's a positive, it's a positive vibration. Yeah. And uh, it just feels like I walk out of there every, doesn't matter how beat up, like I'll, I'll roll like shit most nights, but I walk out of there feeling good. Yeah. And uh, so not to segue, because you also spend a shitload of your own time coaching right now, correct? Yeah, yeah. Um, doing coaching high school wrestling and then coaching a, uh, a kids club we're starting. Um, so anywhere from about four years old all the way up through high school. So where's, um, where's the club? Like if the people, club's if, at the high school, so it's, it's, if uh, people want to get their kid into a, like if they have young children, they want to get into wrestling, where would they go? Is there a website? Is there, uh, I don't know that the website's up and active right now, okay. but, um, yeah, I mean, I would, I would just suggest if anywhere lo- close to you, if there's if there's a club and there's a wrestling club you can get into, get your kids into wrestling. I'm okay. It doesn't I, in my opinion, I don't think it matters yeah. where you're going, just as long as you're in the sport. But at the same time, like there's something to be said for waiting and getting kids into some other stuff before they start doing that. Like, well, um, it's it's all about trying different stuff and seeing yeah. what the, like yeah. with my boys. I brought the way I ended up at the jujitsu gym is I brought my boys there in 2020 when. Uh, everything was closed and Greg's my longtime friend. So I was like, Oh, Hey, he's defying the governor governor's orders. He's open. Hey, if you guys want to go to a, a padded room and wrestle other kids and they were like, fuck yeah, I do. Yeah. And, uh, after three, I think they only stayed with it for like three or four months and they were like, had enough. And I was fine. Cause I grew up playing football and baseball and I knew enough kids whose dads made them play and they mm-hmm. were miserable. I was like, all right, if yeah, yeah. one of, one of my rules with my boys is I'll never force them to do anything. It's, it's gotta be on their own. So they, they've moved on and they, they like soccer, but yeah. that doesn't mean that three years oh, from now they won't be like, they'll Hey, can back. we go try jujitsu again? You know yeah. what I mean? Um, Aren't most of Olympic athletes, multi-sport people. You gotta sure, well, yeah, yeah, especially yeah, yeah. when you're eight years old. Like, yeah. Yeah. But I mean like, uh, most of them do like soccer as they're younger and then baseball in like middle school, high school, and then switch to football. And then they usually fall in love with something yeah. and then yeah, track or something. And then they excel and yeah, you win gotta, gold. Right. Find the one you like. Yeah. Fucking uh, curling. You know, <laughs> that's how you're getting there, brother. <laughs> you're gonna find yeah. find some spots like that. Yeah. Curling's for forty year olds with a beer belly. <laughs> hey, dude. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll take a gold medal in the Olympics with right. anything I could. I'll, I, yeah. yeah fuck well, yeah. Oh, I do badminton. Oh, 100. <laughs> yeah. But one one of the things I can say is like, it's funny, like, because I we're sitting. I'm in a room with uh, three guys who can kick the shit out of me. Greg always says, if you're in a room with with a bunch of people and you're the toughest guy in the room, you're in the wrong room. Well, I'm, I'm definitely in the right room. <laughs> um, when I roll with Jordan and like, again, I, I have no martial arts background, no experience really to speak of, but I've been an athlete all my life. And uh, it's, it's a different game. Like you guys can't see him, but he he's, he's as deep as he is wide in his head. <laughs> like he is like, if you look at his forehead and chin, this is the missing link. Right? <laughs> and you wouldn't expect him to move like he does. Because uh-huh. he moves like water. Thank you. And like it's smooth and <laughs> fluid and fast. And uh-huh. it's, it's it's not like anybody else in the gym. It's fucking, it's kind of scary. And when like you slap and bump with him and he crouches down into that, like whatever your little stance, your your takedown stances, it's like, God damn it. There's there's no reason that's, for me to even do any anything. Stance. <laughs> there's no is. reason for <laughs> me any, to do any sort anything of stance other than just fucking stand here and wait for what's coming. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah, I think you guys give me too much credit because there's, there's guys that, Beat my ass. Yeah, there's always somebody tougher. Oh yeah, but it was like yeah. But didn't you go time. down to Worlds? <laughs> it was all the last time. year. I did. Yeah. yeah. And you placed, right? Yeah, I got third. But you know, yeah, it's still yeah, medal it's, it's in the world. Wrong, it's tight. Yeah, it's tight. yeah. But you know, like I've just I've had my ass beat enough to know like 
but that's how you I get stand, good. You know? If you never have your ass beat, you're 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 a joke. You're a poser. Oh yeah, yeah. you know yeah. what I mean. Yeah. There's always going to be someone that yeah. beats you. Well, and it just it just like it it just humbles you. You know, you just realize yeah. like, oh, you know, this is uh, the reality is is like you know there are motherfuckers out there. And but also it gives is real. You, it gives you drive though. Too. Oh, Oh, hundred percent. When they beat you, you're like, I want to be better. I don't want this person constantly fucking me up. Yeah. And that's motive. That's fuel right yeah. there. I didn't that's get how you get better. The first two months I was down in school when I was down in school at Oregon at Clackmas. Yeah, I didn't get a takedown for two months. <laughs> guys sure. beat. The, and I mean, there was a couple kids, but it was like those weren't the top guys. But like the guys, right. they fucked right. me up good. <laughs> And then, then I slowly, you know, it was like what you're saying, though. Like, then you start figuring it out, and you get the pace, and you figure out how to grind, and, you know, yeah. the game just changes a little bit at that level, and the next thing you know, it's like, oh, like, got one. I'm, I'm yeah, yeah, now I'm in it. Now yeah. I'm, you know, now I'm in the lineup. Now I'm doing, you know, so. Fuck yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's definitely a cool, cool grind to get on. And it's just like anything else, like jiu-jitsu for you, it's the same thing. Like, you didn't walk in there going, like, I know what I'm doing or no. anything like that. But, like, slowly over time, you've progressed and started seeing that like you know you, you've started beating people i've seen it you know yeah. uh, so I'm not sure that i have <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I might be two years without a without a win um all right, well, you, you guys <laughs> what no I, I i yeah it's not true but no. yeah um well, you guys flew right through your your uh intro your intros yeah I was, uh, well, I mean, you know, like I said, I, I didn't have a whole lot. I just wanted to sit down and talk with you guys. You know, that's yeah. the fun part of this is like we were talking about it, and you know, I'm like, oh, shit, what's my what's my drive for this? And it's for me, it's been one of those things where, with the times, and you know, I'm plugged into a phone. Like I, I was just out today getting lunch before I came, or you know, before you guys came, and uh, I'm sitting down, and I'm looking around, and there's couples, and they're just sitting staring at their phone all day. I got oh, my dude, phone in front crazy. of me right now. And it's 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 tough to get unplugged for any length of time and actually have a conversation with somebody. Yeah. So the fact that this is gonna force that, and I, I do need discipline uh, built in because if I don't have something like this, if I don't have something to research to talk about, like I'm really excited about it because like I'm hoping at some point we can make this podcast a thing where we have okay, we're gonna talk about backpacks, we're gonna talk about hunting, we're gonna talk about jujitsu, we're gonna talk about dogs we're going to talk about you know whatever fishing like you yep. know whiskeys or whatever and then we can bring people in that like oh yeah know what the hell's going on yep. and we can take a little bit of time and like research like okay this is that and like if i have a small project and like that carrot right there i kind of i kind of need that yeah um, okay i operate best with that you know thing so having this to you know unplug and not have to stare at a phone you know it, it's good for me Fuck so yeah that's that's as much of the selfish reason I'm wanting to do this as anything else, you know. So well, also talking like you're saying, talking with people, everyone's plugging in their phone, but then you go and have a conversation with someone, and people don't know how to talk to other people. Like they'll talk about their job, they'll talk about themselves, they'll talk about arbitrary things. You know, it's never a deeper, interesting conversation. I, I forget how the phrase actually goes, but it's like. Stupid people talk about people. Smart people talk about events. And great people talk about ideas. Yeah. You know? And the ability to actually have an, a deeper intellectual or an abstract conversation where you can parlay it into other ideas or philosophies. It's kind of it's kind of rare having people that are willing or open or just have the mindset to want to divulge deeply into a subject and link it to other subjects. So it's nice to have people that are engaged, you know, yeah. and really care and you know, maybe you don't have that idea, but through talking to other people, it stimulates your own thoughts. It's like, yep. I don't really care what you think. I'm more interested in why you think that. Yeah. And absolutely. that's, you know, that's mental masturbation. And that's kind of what I like, you know, that's, that's, that's the right, Somebody part. needs to make Kozak a t-shirt that says <laughs> mental masturbation. That's what I like. <laughs> and we'll definitely get uh, Stan away in here. Yeah, Cause absolutely. Because that, that dude, w I mean, he's got some ideas that are way out there and I don't agree with all of them, but some of them are, they're, I should say, they're actually, they're all fascinating as fuck. And uh, he's very well researched and rehearsed in, yeah. in what he believes. And uh, 
the thing I like about him is most like quote unquote conspiracy theorists will get mad at you if if they start talking and you don't instantly go, oh yeah, yeah, agree yeah, yeah. with you. It, he doesn't care. Yeah. Like you can push back against him and ask questions and challenge it a little bit. It doesn't he doesn't get butthurt about it. And even if you go, you know what, man, I think that one's completely bullshit. He's like, Okay, I don't actually know. I'm just Yeah. I'm just well he's after the truth, right? Exactly. So that's that's all he cares about is like what at the end yeah. of the day, what's what's going on with it. So Well yeah. and I'm I'm more like going back to your point, Mike, about how people don't know how to have a conversation. I'm more likely to listen to him now because he doesn't like get all fired up and angry. He's like, I'm I'm just giving some information. You do with it what you want. Yeah. And you don't have to believe what I believe, which in the end, I'm like, hey, Tyler, what do you think about this? And so it's led me down all these different rabbit holes. Like I was, he gave me an alternate history book to read. And so I was kind of flipping through it. And some of it I can, I'm like, yeah, I, I can see that. And some of it I'm like, no, nah, there's no chance. Yeah. But it brought up the point of like, if I took a U.S. history book and handed it to you guys, you'd go, oh, yeah, this is a U.S. history book. This is what happened. But if I just take this alternate history book and stamp U.S. history on it, then does everybody immediately believe it because it says U.S. history and it's in a box of textbooks that are being distributed it's at a high school? Out. Yeah. So how do we, like, we assume that what's written in this history book that's passed around at our high school is all correct, but I wasn't there. You weren't there. Yeah. Who the fuck wrote it? Yeah, yeah. I didn't and had any I, bones. I couldn't yeah. tell you. <laughs> and and you know, this is part of this uh, this awakening deal. The last couple of years is do do we we would really need to start questioning now who wrote these books because I see this put your tinfoil hats on, but uh, especially with like uh, you know think like all the January sixth tribunals and the news reports talking about the January sixth violence. I don't think that's meant for us in this generation. I think that by the time we're two generations down the road, anything that's in the news will just look be looked back on as fact. Yeah. Because you, if you and you can see it right now with uh, a lot of the trans movement stuff, where they're saying, "Oh no, Mike can identify as a girl. Jordan's a cat." And me, I go, uh, "That's definitely not correct." But I'm so tired of the arguments online, like or. I shouldn't even say I'm tired of them. I just won't engage in an online argument or I won't even associate with people who kind of think that way. But the, but the fact that it's in our public schools now means that you have my generation will go, well, I know that's not correct. But yeah. then my kids will go, well, there's these people at school, dad, who they say that boys are girls and you could be a cat or a dog or a, a fucking zebra if you want to be and they'll put a litter box in the bathroom for you. And then by the time, and I'll be like, yeah, but that's, that's all bullshit, guys. They're like, yeah, it's all bullshit. But then they'll have kids, and then their kids will go to school in that system and come home and be like, there's a kid in my class who's a zebra. They'll be like, oh, yeah, we had that when I was your age. And by the time their kids have kids, that'll just be the norm. Yeah. And what will be left in 100 years if someone researches January 6th attack on the Capitol? Yeah. It'll be yeah. all these news oh, yeah. articles about violence. And it's like, hang on. A dude in a buffalo hat went inside and took selfies. Or grandmas walking through yeah. velvet ropes. Yeah. You well, know, it's like, that's not. But if what, yeah. if what exists 100 years from now is just a bunch of news clippings of the, viol yeah. the quote unquote violence at the Capitol, then that becomes history. Yeah. Yeah. And so. It's I, like had, I had a coach that was there. Is that and, right? Yeah, what? And he said, he was like, no, it wasn't. It was, it was peaceful. Well, he was, he yeah. was at the, the rally. Um, he didn't go down to the Capitol. Or but I mean, anything, but the there is, there even in, the people in who in went Washington. inside, whether or not that and he was like, no, it wasn't, it wasn't bad at all. It's in Pelosi's like, office. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I collected documents over there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh shit, man. Yeah. That's the only way for ideas to end is for them to die. Like yeah. and to die means generations die. Like take St Tyler, for example, like he's all into metalwork and forgery and stuff. It was just like the other day I saw something on YouTube about Japanese people making a, a hardened steel, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not usually made by most Western or industrial technologies. It's a way of forging them. And only those people know about it. And so if they die, that idea is lost. Cool. So ideas only exist as long as people know them and are living and sharing them. Once those people are gone... Well, then it's just whatever was written in the past that's still alive today. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't understand that when I was younger. And then, you know, all the book burning and stuff. I was like, what? what's that about? What it's I, like, yeah. oh, just, you know, 
and it, it in makes, the civilization. It makes you wonder because again, tinfoil hat stuff. The if, Romans salting yeah, the if, earth. If you believe some of this alternate history stuff, then World War One and the Spanish flu were a were a reset. It was a wiping of history and a rewriting. And so, if you look at perhaps COVID, and we're on the brink of World War Three right now. Is, is we're I in mean, it. Yeah. Yeah, we're in yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, but I mean, we're in early phases, right? Yeah. And uh, it's all con- it's all conjecture. But what what if this is an attempt at another? Like maybe too many people are paying too much attention to uh, just sort of government overreach and corruption, and it's like you know what? It's time to wipe it again because the internet came along and suddenly through these little boxes in our hands, we have the ability to share information. And holy shit, mm-hmm. the government does you know what 20 years ago this it's 2022 we uh 2002 yeah so 2002 the only way you're getting information is turning on cnn or fox news or the new york times or the seattle times and you're you're getting like tightly funneled information and along comes uh you know the iphone and the internet and chat forums and suddenly people are sharing information like crazy whether it's you know, true, false, whatever, doesn't mm-hmm. matter. The fact is that ideas are proliferating at like a wild fucking speed that has not yeah. happened before. Well, I, I to allow, to go on that, I think um, there's a guy, uh, Kevin Kelly. He was a founder of Wired Magazine back in the 90s. And it was a huge technology magazine as the internet was really taken on. And he wrote a book called What Technology Wants. It, it, and I recommend it to anyone. I mean, it's a very dry book, but it's fascinating. But one of the things that he said is there's three points in civilization which really dictate the future of it. The first one is the compiling of information, right? The second one is the exchange of information. And the third one is what happens once all that information is exchanged. Yeah. And I feel like part of why everything is so nuts and accelerated for culture, for technology, for everything, is because we're in one of those transition periods where, okay, we have all this data of the past. Everyone's able to share it now. And so now we're in this part where it's like okay everyone can form their own ideas they're starting to get exchanged way more rapidly than it ever would and so we're at a point where old systems of power want to tell you one narrative people are coming up with their own ideas because of what they're seeing with this information and it's just it's accelerated the speed of which people interact of what they form ideas and like culture doesn't know what to do exactly no, bro it's like the it's like we're in the wild west of information right now yeah where it's it's just it's it's everywhere you don't know what's real what isn't people don't know how to react to it governments are trying to figure out how to regulate it yeah it's it, yeah it's it's yeah. crazy right so and maybe part you know another great reason for us doing this podcast is just so that like a record of this conversation exists 20 yeah. years from now, yeah. 40 years from now, 100 years from now. Or maybe it won't because maybe an EMP will wipe everything electronic. Like that's one of the weaknesses in our system right now is we're all, we're like, yay, technology, woohoo. And we're going to electronic everything. Everything's yeah. digital. But yeah. What what if what if we have a brownout or a carve it on a rock and it'll, <laughs> yeah. it'll last forever, exactly. you know? Like, you mean uh, a pyramid? But yeah, whatever, <laughs> right? So, yeah. I mean. Yeah. And what else? Like, like yeah. Going forward, I will definitely be bringing up like alternate history theories and shit like that because I find oh, it yeah. fascinating, especially like uh, um, you know the younger Dryas impact hypothesis and all this stuff. Yes. Like Graham Hancock yeah. and Randall Carlson are, are getting famous for. Well, I'll like, be learning. <laughs> oh, you, are you serious? You're not, yeah, oh, no, bro, I'm, I'm, I'm going to yeah, be sending yeah, you so much shit. It's, me up now, but that's I mean that's why I want to do this, right? Yeah. So it's it just. Well, let, let me give you a, like a down and dirty. The, yeah, the yeah, younger Dryas was like what like twelve thousand years ago, as mm-hmm. the ice age was coming to an end, something happened and caused a bunch of fresh water to hit the Atlantic Ocean. It disrupted the Atlantic conveyor system and caused the world to plunge back into like a mini ice age that they call the Younger Dryas event. So for years, and this is what the climate change uh, politics and climate change theory are based on, that as the world warms, the ice caps melt, fresh water hits the Atlantic Ocean, fucks everything up. And that's, that is where you're getting all this Greta Thunberg, Al Gore, like climate change bad, rah, but more and more, there's evidence that what really happened 12,000 years ago is a couple of comets 
probably probably over like a series like multiple comets over several thousand years uh hit the earth in the ice caps like they're, they're saying like one hit just north of michigan and they can see now this like if you zoom out on google earth you can actually see the evidence where the earth is scarred from where this thing hit the ice cap and then caused this massive explosion and then the splash of basically debris and whatnot was like hitting the earth as far south as south carolina so there's all these, wow. these scars in the, and it's all on a concentric ring it all mat like everything's lining up so there was the comet hit the ice cap caused a massive like rapid melt because you you have all this energy all of a sudden released so Mm -hmm. ice melts instantaneously and they found in the ice cores in greenland they call it meltwater pulse 1a and meltwater pulse 1b they're saying there's no natural way that this much fresh water could have melted this rapidly and suddenly hit the atlantic ocean and caused this this change in the atlantic conveyor and so if that's true it, it shoots the climate change theory all to shit and or more and more as evidence is coming out to support this modern sort of geologists and archaeologists are starting or i shouldn't say modern like nouveau uh, the establishment opposes it hard because that's just what establishments it seems like humans are fucking dumb man like we get so (laughs) stuck in our like here's what happened the rocks hardened and then the dinosaurs were here and then somewhere along the line a monkey turned into a human yeah and we're like you know what? It's it's written in the archaeology book. It's well, done. Oh. Figured it out. Good job, guys. Like no reason, well, no reason to think about it anymore. You think people just want to move on to the next? You know, so they're like, oh, this is figured out. We got this dialed. Yeah, we got we got to keep we got to keep pushing. Look, look at human existence. They used to say human beings were here for eighty thousand years. Yeah, now and now it's like, and then they're like, oh, we found some footprints in New Mexico. Oh, we'll push it back to a hundred thousand years. Oh, we found more evidence in South America. Let's push it down to a couple hundred thousand years. Yeah. So it keep like the more data you find, the more it changes. Mm-hmm. I mean, dinosaurs weren't known until the what 1800s really when they started finding them in north america their bones yeah. and there was a huge debate you know they didn't think asteroids wiped them out yeah you're right you know so it, it constantly changes yeah. and then to go with that on the younger dry it's like being a wannabe hunter um i think megafauna is very interesting in that same time period from the Pleistocene to the Holocene, you see a die-off of all this megafauna from short-faced bears to giant sloths to beavers that were the size of Volkswagen bugs, and they just all died instantly. Yeah. And you look at certain people, um, I forget the guy's name, but um, some of their ideas are like the the overkill hypothesis. You know, so people that took the, the the land ice bridge from the Bering Straits, they came over and they killed all these animals. It's like, mm. wait, they killed a, gr- a band of hunters. By riding bareback. Yeah, with right? beers, they with killed and sharp rocks. every <laughs> megafauna in North America. Get out of, you know how hard it is to kill one animal? Yeah, here's, with a rifle. Here's what we're yeah, gonna do. it we're doesn't gonna, make We're going to jump on this wild Mustang with a handmade bow and arrow. <laughs> yeah. We're yeah. charging into a herd of bison and wipe them And horses up. are yeah. another one. Like, horses yeah. are from North America, right? They evolved in the grasslands. in, yeah. And then... Younger dries happen in the Pleistocene, and they all vanished from North America. And then what happens? The Spanish bring them over to the United States, and they flourish because yeah. they come back to their homeland. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's, yeah. Yeah, there's there's all kind of, Jordan, I'll have to send you a bunch of links. Yeah, for like, have, uh, I, you know. there's, there's some great Joe Rogan episodes. If you guys listening haven't already listened to these, go on uh Joe Rogan's podcast and search Graham Hancock and Randall Carlson because it's fucking fascinating. Yeah. And now every time I drive through Quincy, I'm like, oh, this it's the Scablands. It's the Scablands. This, this is what yeah. Randall Carlson's talking yeah. about. And Jen, I'm not looking at the road, looking yeah. out the window, trying to <laughs> look at those rocks. Yeah. Yeah. Like, Shut <laughs> up, Dad. God. But bro, it's the same shit my dad used to do. He'd be like, he'd park the car on the there side they of the are, highway. Boys. Yeah, he'd get out. <laughs> yeah. And he'd be standing there looking at the at the ridge line. We're like, what are you doing? He's like continental divide right there (laughs) (laughs) what he's like it's where the two the two shelves came together and pushed that ridge line up millions of years ago and we'd be like yeah can we can we go home (laughs) can we get mcdonald's yeah Yeah. 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 oh shit all right well i'm running out of steam here already Uh what what you got mike uh when are we gonna do a backpacking video i think that'll have to be next 
Yeah. We can keep this one short because this was just meant to be an introduction. And then, uh, like I said, we'll, we'll definitely do a lot of hunting content because you guys are both hunters and woodsmen. And I'm a I'm trying not a hunter trying to, trying to be because that's another Bow, bow hunting skills, bow staff skills. You say that we're woodsmen, though, but like mm-hmm. for ranger school, like didn't you have to go live in swamps and woods for like a couple weeks just to survive? Yeah, but you don't have to like. But so your skills. So you, so you did. Yeah. That. Yeah. Yeah. And they made you. No, no, no. I, I, I would consider myself like an an average woodsman as well. Yeah. But hunting is not something that I know. It's something I want to know. And coming for you hunted like, people. I grew up. <laughs> the ultimate game. Uh, yeah, they made a movie about it. Yeah, yeah. but we, we didn't quarter them and put them in a backpack and take them back to the truck. So yeah, it's, that's easy enough. Yeah, but yeah. It's the, that's the part I don't understand. Yeah. So uh, yeah, the the finding and shooting. Well, actually, the finding has proven pretty tough. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. The shooting I've got down. The uh, the cleaning and quartering and then that's processing the back home. That's the part I don't know. That's that's the part I really want to learn. Yeah. Um, so I, I enjoy that part. That's, do that's what, yeah, yeah, I do all my favorite. stuff at home. I won't take it to a butcher. No, no, forget that. Oh, cool. Yeah, awesome. pay and hundreds of sorry. dollars to have it done when you can do it yourself. Fuck yeah. yeah. Well, that 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 there, there's definitely going to be a lot of hunting content. Like I said, like just all things man and all things male because all things male are under attack in society right now, and more than ever, I think we need it. And it's it's so obvious in every aspect of my life, like dealing with kids and. The, the shit from the school and blah, 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 blah. And it's like, where are the men? Yeah. Where well, are the, these, these problems don't, if there was a strong man around, this problem would not be existing right here, right now. And I'm finding myself be like, I used to be pretty passive. Cause I didn't, I knew, I knew that I, I'll get ramped up to the point where I'm like, I'm in this fight till the end. Yeah. And so I didn't, I, I tried to not get involved. Cause I knew that once, once I'm like emotionally committed, like, I'm in it to the fucking bitter end. Yeah. And uh, more and more I'm realizing that's a mistake. And that's probably what a lot of dudes were doing. Like as they're hearing like, think like these Gillette commercials where the boys are wrestling and they're like, oh, don't do that, guys. Like that's toxic masculinity. And I kind of look at that and roll my eyes and be like, yeah, whatever. We know better than that. But more, I think now it's, it's I don't think it's okay to like, turn a blind eye to that kind of shit. I think it's time to push back and me- masculine men are necessary. In s- like if you want to have a safe society, how are you going to do that with a bunch of fucking pussies? Mm-mm. Like that doesn't exist. So I want to like, one of my biggest frustrations right now here on the West coast is I want to live in a society of law and order. That's where I want to raise my kids. That's where I want to have my family. But if you walk around, uh, in any any city on the West Coast right now, it's turning into Gotham City. There's fucking yeah. drug needles ever. There's human shit on the sidewalks. There's, I mean, well, there's no punishment. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The the only punishment left is for people like you and I who have a bank account because they can extort. Can, us. Like they'll yeah. they'll give us a fine and threaten us with jail time and get some money out of it. And that's that that is where we're at with our government is they don't give a fuck about public safety. They only give a shit about control and money. And the only way we're going to fix this is to start making noise and talking about it. Because I think there's a lot of people who feel just like us, but they're either afraid to speak out or they don't know how, or they think they think they're in the minority. And I don't think we're in the minority at all. I think we are maybe as much as like an 80% majority. And even, even people who don't necessarily agree with us on all the issues, I think 99% of people can agree that we all want to live in a, in a society of law and order. And, Part of what I'm trying to promote is personal responsibility. And the reason for that is because I don't want big brother breathing down my neck, which means that if we want to live in a orderly society, we have to take it upon ourselves to do so. And we have to make it that way through our own actions and by teaching our kids to be that way and just through demonstrating like in our everyday lives. Um, And that's, that's where the strong male comes in is morality. Um, uh, fuck, what's the word I'm looking for? A little bit of stoicism, not reacting yeah. to every, like, oh my God, it's, you don't, don't react to every situation by screaming racism or sexism or fucking whatever buzzword of the weekend. And uh, 
So I don't know, man. I'm, I'm hoping that by having these conversations, we can get a little bit of that like masculine energy out there. And then also with training Northwest, like that's, I keep saying that's, that's what we're selling. We're not teaching, we are teaching firearms, but it's a medium through which we are teaching, uh, like strength. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit of community outreach there. Yeah. Moral strength. Like I want people to feel, you kind of. Empowered. Yeah. And I'll, having, having taken, uh, I'd, I'd call it like the, the, you know. The first class, you know, you kind of... Yeah, you were Mark one. Yeah, yeah, right. So I feel a hundred times better than I did. And I, you know, I, yeah. I I was into shooting in the in the sense of hunting. Like I wasn't really out buying guns and doing this or that um, for, for protection or for, you know, anything like that. I was like, oh, I can go hunt with this and I'll buy that gun, buy this gun. And I had a couple and I, I carried and stuff. Um had no clue what the hell I was doing. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I, and same, I, same just, here. just like a lot of people, you know, we'll just get a gun and think, Oh, you know, that's, that's the end of it. I got a gun. I got a pistol in my pocket and you know, that's, that's going to take care of business if I ever need Ready to. to go. Yeah. And, uh, you know, then having spent some time with you on the range and, and learning how to properly handle a firearm was just like, Oh wow. Like I, I had no clue. I didn't know what I didn't know. Yeah. You know, and there was so much that I just didn't understand. And then now, now it kind of opened me up and now I'm just kind of feeling like, okay, I'm at the point where I can really start digging into like technique and how to actually, um, how to actually, um, handle myself if it, if it came to that, you yeah. know, yep. um, there's obviously a bunch of tactics and this things and those things that I, I, I don't know. Um, but just operating, operating a firearm relatively proficiently, I feel pretty confident. Um, so that being the set, you know, that being said, if, if that's what the plan is, it's going to work, Yeah, <laughs> you know, Fuck yeah. It, it worked well for me, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. and I, I see it like it dawned on me watching my kids learn new stuff because anytime they would learn something new, whether like literally like my, uh, my older boy, when he was eight, I was like, all right, you know what? You're going to start cleaning a bathroom. And actually before I came here this morning, both my kids cleaned one of the bathrooms in our house. And the first time he cleaned it, and I was like, I came in, you know, I showed him how to scrub the toilet, how to get the, the bucket with the cleaner in it and the washcloth and wipe everything down and whatnot. He kind of puffed out his chest, and he's like, Mom, Dad, show me how to clean the bathroom. Now I can do it all by myself. It's like, yeah. I, you see them kind of like they did something by themselves, for themselves, and they, they kind of puff their chest out and get a little salty. Well, that's, that's what we need as a society is we need people to be like, you know what? I can fucking handle this situation on my own mm-hmm. and I don't care who you are. That makes you kind of like makes you a little salty. Yeah. And if, if we're ever going to get away from this coming sort of surveillance slash control state, it's going to require a whole lot of us getting kind of salty in order to be like, fuck you. You're not getting involved in my business. You're not going to tell me, uh, how, you know, you're not going to cram this, this education curriculum down my throat. You're not going to give me a central banking currency that you have an on off switch for. I'm not, I'm not getting your fucking smart grid thing attached to my house so that you can cut my power or your, uh, your electric vehicle with, that has a remote on off switch that, Hey, you've Mike, you've driven more than your quota of miles this month. We're just going to have to go ahead and kill your car for a couple of days. Yeah. So it, and because most people have become sort of compliant and fat and dependent. Um, that, that, I mean, I think that is the game plan of the hardcore left. And when I say, I should actually say, when I say left, I'm not talking about liberals or quote unquote Democrats because I'm a liberal. Like, yeah, the, the, I still the, think yeah. I'm a Democrat in yeah. many ways. I don't I, I care what liberal. anyone does for most the, things. Mm-hmm. The word is rooted in the word liberty. Mm. Right. Like I'm, I'm whatever you think I'm down with hearing you out and mm. like, let bring your thoughts. Let's talk about them. Mm-hmm. I may agree with you or I may not, but I'm willing to hear it and I'm not going to freak out about it. And I'm willing, I have sort of like a live and let live ethos that if whatever you're doing, if it's not hurting me or, or hurting my bank account or hurting anybody else, have at it, man. Yeah. Like, Jordan likes dudes. Yeah. That's, you know, that's <laughs> fine. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, I, I didn't think we were going to do a, that. It's on a this little, one, but, it's a little uncomfortable to roll know. nogi with him, but, uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's finding he's, stuff out about it. He himself. shows up in his reason. boxer briefs with <laughs> yeah. a hard on and wants to roll nogi. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this guy. You know, it's funny. I'll say, because uh, I've heard this many times, and everyone says, like, there's an attack on masculinity. Men are under attack. And it's like, to me personally, I don't think it's masculinity. I think it's rationality. You know, I think it's what we're having is a rational revolution. It's not an attack on men. It's like, like you said. Attack on common sense. That, exactly. <laughs> like saying you can identify as anything you want. It's like, I, once again, I don't care what you want to be, but it's like, I'm not going to say that you're a cat or you're a unicorn, right? And so rationality is what I feel is the thing that's under attack. And what you guys stand for and what you kind of say we stand for is just understanding what the truth is. Like you said, you're carrying a gun and you think you're, you're, you're tough and you can handle all this stuff just because you have a gun. But then when you do some classes with Tobin and it's like, Oh, you understand what really being proficient at something is. So once again, rationality is coming back into play and you understand what consequences are, what thinking what thinking an object makes you good and then actually being good with that object is. And so to me, that's what all this is. It's like being out of touch and then people trying to work hard to be in touch. Like we're talking about earlier with you couldn't take someone down for two months, but it's like, yeah, that's what it takes is defeat. You won't take someone down unless you've been defeated for a long time and you work through it. Mm -hmm. And what is that? That's being rational. Oh, he does this. I need to do that. Mm -hmm. That's why something as simple as martial arts is, I think, a great problem-solving tool is that you are instantly shown what you think works and then what actually works. Right. And you're forced to work with that immediate time and that decision and those consequences. And I think that's the biggest thing going on. Like Greg had a police officer, a, a lady, a female police officer on his podcast, and they're talking about the homeless situation in Seattle. And they're she was saying, like, they just want to th or they want to allow them to do drugs. Right. And it's like, well, just let them do it. They're people, right? And part of me as a libertarian, I'm like, yeah, let them do drugs. Everyone has the right to do drugs. But when you're living on a street and you're, you're in that environment where it's like, it's taking away from your ability to have a job, from having relationships, from having dignity. A, yeah. An actual happy life. But they're so much more caught up on like, let's be nice instead of, Hey, Let's give them tough love and be nice at the same thing. That person isn't truly happy. I guarantee no, they're, they're you. Living in in squalor, man. I I my personal opinion on that is we need to open like a massive FEMA type camp, like where it's it's compulsory treatment. Like you're gonna get arrested on the street for fucking things drug, that are drug illegal. Use. Yeah, and then but. If you're a drug addict, you don't get a criminal record for it. You just get put in this camp where you're going to go to mandatory treatment and you're going to be in there for probably a year. Yeah. And on the backside of treatment, there's going to have to be some sort of vocational rehabilitation because you can't just put them back out on the street again. So there's, yeah. and people are, gonna be, and here's, here's where I, you start to see that I have a liberal side, right? Like you can't just expect these people to figure their shit out when their brain is so fucking wasted. Like they have to go into a treatment program. That's going to be pretty hardcore where they're locked inside. And then on the backside, unless you want them to become a dependent of the state for the rest of their life, which I don't, I want people to be independent of the state. Yeah. Or you gotta, you gotta figure out some sort of way to get them independent yeah. or, or just throw them in the fucking ocean. Like that, those yeah, are your, those be are done your, with it. Yeah, exactly. Be done those with it. those kinda, are your two options. I, and I I'm honestly, I'm fine side. with either one. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. 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 I, I, I kind of, I find myself on a little bit more of the harsh side of yeah. that, you know? I mean, they're already showing that they have very little regard for their own life or anybody so, else's around. Yeah, them. exactly. So at know? that, at this point, if you did just put them on a sailing boat, 
and 50 miles out. Bon voyage. Yeah. Punch a hole in the bottom of it. Well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, and th- as terrible as that sounds, it's just kind of like, you know, at, at well, some point, look, you look just at, throw look up at, your hands. Look at go, their life hey, right now. You know? Yeah. yeah what, what are you perpetuating if you let them go another 10 years until they finally kill themselves from an overdose? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then taking them back out of it. And yeah. Letting oh, them dude. overdose and f- saving them. And I, them I, have, I have a close friend who's a, a, a fireman EMT down in Portland. And a few months ago, he's like, dude. Somebody was taking all our Narcans out of our aid packs and putting empty canisters of Narcan back in, <laughs> so that when they showed up at overdoses, they'd be, you know they'd try to administer the Narcan and be like, "Oh shit, I, we we got nothing." And he's like, "No, none of us were complaining." You know oh, what I mean? Like, yeah. he's like, "I I would never do something like that because yeah, the you, you go to jail for yeah. that." But uh, all the guy, he's like, all the guys at the firehouse were like, "All right, well." Whatever. Well, the, just, the amount of people I've heard that come out of a Narcan, you know, that when their life is being saved and they come up swinging, pissed off, yeah. like you're ruining and my high, you know. God, my yeah. girlfriend's brother in Philly, he he wa- he rolls around with Narcan in his truck, and he said he's he's done it twice. Are and you he, serious? Yeah, I, I think I think he said twice. Um, one time he he saved a guy and he got up and he was all pissed off and he wanted to fight him. Jesus. You're just like, what the fuck? You know, so I... Uh, it's where you do a bump yourself and beat the shit out of him. Right? He's yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, he needs to go to jiu-jitsu. <laughs> and, yeah. Oh, goddamn. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's weird. It doesn't make sense. Put him in the comatose clutch, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, fortunately, society has pr- plenty of problems. So, between uh, fun stuff and problem stuff, we should have no... Uh, no end to, to topics to talk about. Yeah. Yeah, there's enough pop culture and weird shit and politics going on that, yeah, it's an endless supply. Yeah. So, uh, what are we, I, gonna, we're, we did decide on a name for this, huh? Should we call it around? I think we'll call it around the fire. I like that. I like DILF. DILF? DILF. Oh, Dilf. shit. Mm. Yeah. Endless Endeavor. (laughs) (laughs) Endless Endeavor podcast with Mike Kozak, Jordan Creek, and Tobin Folk. (laughs) Uh, That's good. Let's do it. A Uh, unique one, you know? Yeah, I like that. All right, man. Well, uh, I guess I'll say you can find me at uh, trainingnorthwestllc.com. And we're on Instagram and YouTube as just Training Northwest, one word. Mike, uh, you got anywhere you want people? Oh, what, what's your business uh, website? I mainly deal with insurance companies. No, I'm not no. mainly cut. If you want to find me, find me at Electric North. There you go. Usually yeah. Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And teaching kickboxing? On, kickboxing Sunday on Sunday nights at 6 o'clock, yes. All right. Jordan, you got uh, anything you want to plug? No, no, man. I'll, I'll be there. I'll be there uh, at Electric North as well. More and more now that the wrestling season's over. <laughs> Fucking Perfect. Ass. All right, man. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop it right here. Over yeah. and out. Thank you.